Thank you for that word. That was deeply moving, actually, and fits so much with much of what is in the text before me. It's an honor to be in this church and among you. I have known Justin for a number of years as he is a graduate of Gordon-Conwell Seminary. He was there before I was as a professor, but his legend is large there. And I can tell you, I have visited his former church several times and know many of its members, and they would love it if I would serve as a bounty hunter today uh, and bring him back. But I said, no, I'm not going to do that. And uh, after clergy appreciation, I'm sure that would not avail at all. Uh, so uh, this was the right day to do that, you all, because there was, there was a, a little coup that was urged upon me, and I was, no, 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 we're not going to do that. This is very important for him to be here, and I love seeing the enthusiasm of this congregation. I mean, do you recognize that you sing better than almost any congregation I've been in in New England? You want to just say, yay, Lord, thank you, Lord? I mean, that's... And, and the way you spoke boldly the 23rd Psalm, I just thought, wow, this church is alive. Now, you have to understand a couple of things about me. Number one, I'm a poor, pitiful Presbyterian. So, you know, the competition is very different in that world. And in fact, I have not preached in a Baptist church in 40 years. And I sat here just a moment ago going, that's a strange thing to have a curtain right there. You would normally have wood right there. And then it dawned on me what might be behind the curtain. Could I just take a peek? I just, just. That's what I thought. That's what I thought. But I didn't know quite, because, you know, we don't do it that way in a Presbyterian world. So now that my curiosity is quenched, I think I can proceed. Um, but. Our text today comes from the ninth chapter of Matthew. And I've been teaching uh, in that room the last couple of months on the theme of evangelism and discipleship. And so I wanted to revisit an evangelism passage. So I'm going to warn you on the front end that this one has to do with you. So would you turn to your neighbor and just say, honey, I think he's going to be talking to you today. Would you do that right now? Okay, I just want to make sure they're away. It goes like this, Jesus, and, and you actually, and Justin, you must have been very wise in selecting this, that second song, the Compassion Hymn, comes so deeply out of this very passage. So you just practically sang the passage. Verse 35, Jesus went through all of the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowd, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Let's pray. Lord, would you allow your word to speak to us in such a way that we become transformed by it and begin to see what you see. For we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. It was April the 15th, 1912. That was the day, if you like baseball, that Fenway Park opened in Boston. Did you know that? April the 12th. I mean, April the 15th, 1912. But something more famous happened on that day than the opening of Fenway Park. That was the day that the Titanic sank. The Titanic was a brand new ship. And you probably know the story of the sinking of the Titanic because many of you have watched the film uh, of the Titanic with Leonardo DiCaprio and Kate Winslet and so you kind of saw all of that. But what you might not know as well is the rescue of the survivors of the Titanic. See, strangely, 
That day, as the Titanic was sailing west, there was another ship headed actually to Boston. And it was named the Californian. And the Californian had found the ice field before the Titanic. And it decided to put down anchor and it sent a wireless message, which was a new technology then, not wireless like our wireless, but similar. And they sent a message to the Titanic that there was a dangerous ice field and they recommended halting the voyage until the ice flow went by. But remember the Titanic was in a hurry. They wanted to get across the Atlantic faster than anybody had ever done it in this brand new ship. And the Titanic thought it was unsinkable. So it ignored the warning. It crashed into the iceberg. It thought we're unsinkable, no problem. And only a few hours later discovered, whoops, this is a problem, a terrible problem. And at that point, the wireless operator on the Titanic sent a message to the Californian, we need help. We're going to sink and we need somebody to come help rescue. The message arrived on the Californian 10 minutes after the wireless operator had gone to bed. So no one got that message until the next day. A little later that evening, as things were getting even more frightening, they sent up seven red flares into the night sky of the Titanic. And the night watchman on the Californian saw the seven red flares and didn't know what those actually meant. So with some bit of courage, he went down and woke up the captain, Captain Lord, who was questioned about this in front of Congress, and said, I just saw seven red flares. I'm not sure what they meant. What do you think they mean? And the captain said, I think they were signaling a ship coming behind them about the dangerous ice fields. And so the captain went back to sleep, and the night watchman went back to his watch. Now, they were only four miles from the Titanic, four. The lights of the Titanic were visible from the Californian. That's how close help was. And the night watchman, at going from one side of the ship to the other, came back eventually and noticed the lights were out. And his conclusion was, they must have sailed back to the east and have gone over my horizon. Meanwhile, it had just sunk. Thousands, or, or several, uh, over a thousand, were in the water, cold North Atlantic. 700 or so were in little lifeboats. And everyone on the Californian slept through the night. Four miles away. There was a second ship that got the wireless message. It was named the Carpathia. Carpathia was 58 miles away. It was a cruise ship heading from the United States to the Mediterranean, had wealthy people on board who were ready to enjoy all of the splendor of the Mediterranean. It was 1912 and people did these wonderful cruise ships long before cruise lines came about. But the captain of that, Captain Rostrum, got the message, the wireless message, that they were in distress. And in the middle of the night, he called onto the deck all kinds of people who were lawyers and doctors and financiers and said, we are no longer going to be a cruise ship. We're going to be a rescue ship. And he turned the boat north, increased the speed from 14 knots to 17 knots, and it was that ship that arrived at 4 a.m. And everybody that was saved from the Titanic, the 705 survivors, presumably including Rose from the movie, they were all picked up by the Carpathia. One ship slept comfortably through the night, while another cruise ship became a mission ship. When you think about your church, 
Are you more like the Californian or more like the Carpathia? Are we sleeping through a cultural disaster of some sorts or are we mobilized in a different way? That will be the lingering question. Who are we more like? So let's dive into this passage and look at it kind of inch by inch. Jesus is doing amazing ministry. That's the context. He is declaring the good news of the kingdom all around and healing and touching people. And then he comes to a moment where the text says in verse 36, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. There are a lot of Greek words for the verb to see. This one is a word that is often translated in other contexts, behold. Uh, behold meaning notice. And, and so when Jesus noticed the crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. I don't know about you, but many of us have the ability to see things that we actually don't see. Sometimes my wife Sarah and I will go to have dinner in somebody's home, and in the ride back she'll say, what did you think of the curtains in the dining room? Or the draperies in the dining room? And I'll say, were there draperies in the dining room? She said, you had to brush against them to get to your seat. Now, am I the only one, or is anybody with me? I'm going to see who is with me on this. Okay, I just don't notice things like draperies. Um, but there are people in this text. Do we see them? Do we see them? That, that's part of the question that is in our minds because when you receive Jesus and when the person of Jesus comes into your life, presumably you have received the eyes of Jesus. Do we notice things like Jesus does? Isn't it interesting? We just had that little story about Meshach. It's very easy to not notice children in third world countries who are begging on the street and are homeless. You just don't want to look because if you engage them, they might ask you for something. And yet the heart of the gospel is to notice and to see. To notice and to see. To see genuine people in front of us. Do you have the eyes of Jesus? Secondly, the text says, when he saw the crowd, he had compassion on them. Now, you've sung about compassion in that middle hymn today. When he noticed them, that was the picture he got. They were harassed and helpless people. They were like sheep without a shepherd. Now, most of us do not come from sheep-raising country. So we're not sure really what a sheep without a shepherd looks like. But let me give you a modern analogy. It would be like a junior high class with a substitute teacher. Do you know what that looks like? I mean, that can be kind of chaotic. Uh, that's what it means to be harassed and helpless here. When he saw the crowd, he saw that they're not in their best moment. To be harassed literally means to be vexed or troubled or annoyed. And to be helpless means to be hurled down or scattered or dispersed. There's something about people when you actually see them. Some of us may have the misguided understanding that the people who are sitting at home right now on a Sunday and not having to come to church and endure this Presbyterian are in a much better place than we are. But you know, I'm not convinced they are. One of the most famous lines of St. Augustine was, O oh Lord, you have created us for yourself and our hearts will be restless until we find our rest in thee, O Lord. That means that you understand people not in Christ have some degree of restlessness about them. They're trying to solve that restlessness by all kinds of things, ranging from materialism to sensualism to relationships. They're trying to do all kinds of things, and to some degree, they will keep it at bay, but there is a certain restlessness if you're made to be God's own and you're not God's own. Harassed and helpless like lost sheep. In the United States right now, there are 150 million people unconnected to God's people in a church. 
150 million people. There are only four countries in the world who have more unreached people than the United States. China, India, Russia, and Indonesia. We're fifth on the list. Now, we've got a lot of people. Percentage-wise, there are places that are far less reached for Christ. Uzbekistan, etc. But in terms of the sheer number of people, 150 million people is an enormous mission field. And when you look at the states where the highest percentage of unreached people are, the three states of northern New England and the two states of the Pacific Northwest get to be tops of the list. So that means you're living in a mission field in Maine. Do you see it? They're harassed and helpless like lost sheep. Thirdly, the text says Jesus had compassion on them. He felt for them. It disturbed him that they were that way. Compassion is something you also received when you received Christ. It came in the package. And so when Christ comes into you, his compassion comes into you, the only problem is we have the option of turning it off. And most sociologists tell us that Americans now have compassion fatigue. We've seen too many commercials and heard too many stories about too many difficult situations, and we need to just turn the compassion off. I lived in Colorado Springs before I moved to Massachusetts 10 years ago. And that, uh, that international mission group called Compassion is there. You have pictures up of Compassion children in this church. And you would hope that the people who work at Compassion might have a little, you might hope, yeah. And Wes Stafford was the president when I was there, and Wes and I would get together for lunch usually twice a year, and we would always do it at a little restaurant named the Black Eyed Pea, and we would sit in a booth, and I'd say, Wes, where have you been, and what have you seen lately? And he would describe going to places like Goma, and like India and describe the children that were there and almost without fail every time we gathered in the middle of Black Eyed Pea, Wes would begin to cry about the children he was telling me about and when Wes began to cry I would begin to cry and two grown big men in Black Eyed Pea crying at lunch bothered the waiters and they would come around and say are you okay do you need anything do you need another napkin but you see compassion is contagious Jesus is feeling compassion for this crowd that is around him and my question is are you allowing compassion to really flow through you or have you kind of turned it off because I think part of being a Christian is bearing a compassionate heart. And it will make you sad at times. And it will make you disturbed at times. And when you have missions committees who tell you stories like we heard today, that's to awaken compassion and open us to more. So three things the eyes of Jesus, the nature of the harassed people, and the compassion of Jesus, lead Jesus to make an outrageous statement. The fields are white to the harvest. He sees plentiful possibilities. Between all of this pressing need, he says, I think there is something out there ready to be brought in. He sees aspects of the kingdom emerging. The crying need was present, but so was the power of God. And I'm privileged to sit in a place like Gordon Conwell where we have students from 50 different countries in the world. Not long ago, we had 16 students from China. And they're telling me the fields are white to the harvest. It's amazing what's going on in places around the world, and most of them are places where persecution is occurring, and yet the church is thriving. Do you know where the fastest growing church in the world is right now? Iran. Iran. That's where the church is growing numerically faster than any place in the world. Wow! 
the fields are white to the harvest. But what does Augusta look like to you? Are there white fields there? Is there a need here? Can you see the unreached, de-churched, under-reached people all around you? Can you see the possibilities? There's plentiful possibilities, and yet there is one problem. One problem. Could you turn to your neighbor and say, I think it's you. <laughs> the one problem is the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. There are not enough people in the harvest to bear the good news of Jesus with someone else. There are many churches not involved in the harvest. Do you know in the United States there are 360,000 churches? Write that number down somewhere. 360,000 churches. And 80% of them are either plateaued or declining. In my little Presbyterian tribe, it's 90% that are plateaued or declining. Of the ones that are growing, they're growing more by what we call the circulation of the saints, meaning I've left one church to find a better one, I'm looking for a better deal. But somehow with the plentiful possibilities all around us, most of us in churches are not harvesting. The plain truth is we just don't have enough people willing to take a step. Almost every church I go to has a mission statement that says something about evangelism and mission in it. And yet, Rather little is being done in many, many places. I think you're the exception. But let me just tell you a little picture that Soren Kierkegaard gave. He loved to give these little parables. And he told a parable once about a man who was walking down the sidewalk and saw a sign in a shop window that said, pants pressed here. And he looked at his trousers. And he thought, you know, I think they could use a pressing. So he went into the little shop and began undoing his belt, and the man behind the counter said, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm about to give you my pants. What? Why are you about to give me your pants? Well, they need pressing. Well, what does that have to do with me? Well, you press pants. Who told you that? Well, there's a sign in your window that says pants pressed here. And the man said, I see your problem. We don't press pants here. We paint signs here. And you see, Kierkegaard was poking the Danish church of his day, who all had mission statements about reaching the lost, and none were doing it. Jesus has one solution. And this is where my clue comes in, that Jesus is not a Presbyterian. Because our solution would be to study the problem, form a committee, appoint a task force, write a position paper. Um, Jesus' solution is none of that. His solution is... Therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out more people into the harvest field. Now, interestingly, I go to churches all the time. Do you know, I almost never hear a church pray that prayer. Lord, would we want you to send more of us into the harvest field. Lord, we want you to send more churches in Augusta into the harvest field. I almost never hear a church pray that prayer. And that's one of the prayers Jesus said, I want you to pray. We strategize, we educate, we think about. So today, I'd like us to just pray. But I want you to do it in a funny way. I want you to look at the person on your right and on your left. Would you look at them both right now? Okay, I want you to pray for those two people. That God would urge those two people into the harvest field. That means somebody on your right and left is praying that for you too. But let's pray for a moment, and then we're going to have a pop, we're going to have a pop quiz, and then we're going to pray for those people. So the pop quiz is this, because I teach now, so we have to do quizzes at the end. The harvest is. Okay, you're going to have to come back at the next service. Uh, I'll try that again. Let's do that one more time. The harvest is, fill in the blank, plentiful. The workers are, therefore, okay, I think you can go. Let's pray. Lord, your harvest is so serious to you, and somehow... Many of us get the feeling it's optional. 
or the pastor will do it, or Billy Graham will come back from the dead and do it. But Lord, you're calling us to do it. And our prayer today is that you would raise up more of us to be involved in the harvest and have the yearning to want to find out how. So we give our lives and our hopes to you. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.